and what the heck happened to you? Five years ago, you made two videos about the tape recorders that were featured in the original Mission Impossible TV series that ran between 1966 and 1973. Apparently, those two videos were going to be part of a three-part series, but then things went very quiet. Now, from the look of you, you were either marooned on a deserted island or locked away in a South American prison. Given that you've aged 10 years in the last five, perhaps it's a good idea to actually make part three now while you're still able to. Your mission then is to make a video about this, the Concord F20, a tape recorder that played the mission briefing at the start of 24 episodes. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds and don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, so just a quick recap to bring everyone back up to speed. In the original Mission Impossible TV series, a typical episode would open up with Jim Phelps, who was played by Peter Graves, arriving at a location where he would find a secreted mini reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, as well as an envelope of photos, and the mission briefing for that particular episode would be given by the tape, which would then self-destruct. This recording will self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs> In the first of my videos about this, I looked at the most commonly used machine in those intros. It was a Sanyo MC2, although they'd used one that had been rebadged by Craig, and that machine had been used in 48 episodes. Now, the next video featured the Craig TR212, which again originated from Sanyo, and that one appeared in 39 episodes. And today is the turn of the Concord F20, which was used at the start of 24 episodes. Although in the second season, one of those seven appearances was only in the second part of a two-parter, where it featured in the pre previously on Mission Impossible bit at the start. Its first appearance was in episode 10 of the first season, when Dan Briggs finds it inside a photo booth, and then it last showed up in episode 22 of season 6, where it was found in a locker in a changing room full of diving equipment. The F-20 was one of a number of models of tape recorders sold by Concorde in the US, and it was introduced towards the end of 1965. In the August 1966 edition of Electronics World, they did a roundup of battery-operated tape recorders, and the Concorde F-20 at $24.95 was the cheapest model they tested. As a comparison, the first Philips tape recorder, rebranded as Norelco in the US due to the similarity between the Philips name and Philco, well, that model sold for just under $100, so four times as much as the Concorde. And a year before, in 1965, the Philips cassette player had been introduced to the US at $150. So it's good to know that the IMF, that's the Impossible Mission Force, were being careful with your tax dollars when choosing which tape recorders to destroy. So let's take a closer look at the machine itself. Now, I'm fortunate to have the full set here with the box as well as all the documentation. In amongst that, we've got the 90-day warranty, some maintenance tips, Details of a variety of accessories, and that shows that a 300-foot tape reel would cost $1.19. And there's also a catalogue of sorts that shows the full range of Concorde tape machines at this time. Now, the Concorde Corporation is shown here as being at 1935 Armacost Avenue in Los Angeles. A look on Google Street View shows that this was unused when the most recent image was taken. However, going back prior to that, its previous tenant was California Cryobank, which isn't the kind of bank that's worth holding up for the customer's deposits. But back to the box, we have a nice set of instructions which advise that the tape reel supplied with the machine is just 100 feet in length, and that's only good for five minutes of recording time in each direction. I also have all the supplied accessories in here. That includes a wrist strap, an earphone, and a microphone. Now, that mic has a two-pin connector on the end. That's to allow the operation of a remote pause feature with the switch for this being located on the top of the mic. Now, when I first saw the machine itself, I wondered what the deal was with the Duck logo. But, of course, a 90-degree rotation to the right reveals that it's supposed to be a treble clef. So, whilst we're more familiar with a tape player being used in this orientation, the F20 is really supposed to be used on its side, one reel above the other. 
the sockets and the lanyard loop, they're all on the top of the case. And the speaker is on the rear at the top. And below there is the battery compartment. It runs off four AA batteries. There's no indication of battery life in the instructions, but I suspect it wouldn't be great, even on alkalines. All the controls located on this same side and the tape transport controls are very simple. We've just got play or rewind. There's no fast forward on this one. The tape reels that are included with this, you can see were the ones that were originally supplied with it when new. And you can also see that they're 62 millimeters in diameter, so not quite two and a half inches across. The mechanism is a very simple rim drive system. That means that the tape speed will vary over the length of the tape. And the rewind, that only winds it back at double speed. So it takes two and a half minutes to rewind one of these five minute reels. Let's have a look at how it was used in the show. So here I've documented all 23 separate original appearances of the Concord F20 in the series, together with the details of the location in which the tape player was found. But if we look at the top here, you'll see it appeared three times in the first season, but two of those were in a photo booth. And that's because for reasons of efficiency, cost or time savings, or just because they could get away with it back in the day before people examine these things with unnecessary detail, they often reuse these intro sections. They just swapped out the photos and the tape voiceover. Good morning, Good morning Mr. Mr. Briggs. The man this you're looking at is Perenk Lowell, enemy expert by American tradition. So while we might have 23 appearances, there are some reuse segments in there. If we go back and sort the list by the location name, it reveals that there are just 14 different segments that were recorded with the F20. In amongst these, we've got a slightly unusual trio here using a rooftop location. I say unusual because there are two different takes that were used for this. They've also swapped out Jim's jacket and tie and altered the camera placement, but they've clearly shot both scenes on the same day in the same location. They also use the same idea with the other tape machines as well. I've featured that in a previous episode. But after season three, it seems they didn't go back and do this again, presumably because nobody would really remember which side of the car Jim had got out of in a previous episode. And no doubt these were shown months and months apart and people hadn't got any way of recording them. So it was unnecessary to make this much effort. Getting back to the list, though, we've got five episodes here that seem to use the same prop, but it's in two different locations. It's this red firebox. It appears both on a woodland path as well as next to a stream. While we're here, notice the damage that's occurred to the machine. The speed and volume controls have been taped over. Of course, this is only really visible now thanks to HD and freeze frames. You can see that same beat-up machine in another episode too. Perhaps the self-destruction effect had proved to be a little bit too realistic. But while we're talking unimportant nitpicky continuity errors that are only visible with modern tech, let's have a look at this scene. Look at the pigeon lady's unpainted fingernails. And she's also got a plaster on her thumb. I suspect the pigeon's to blame for that. Anyway, being from season one, they're still playing around with the way these sequences worked. And in this one, she has to give the tape to Dan. Well, I say she does. Somebody somewhere else with painted fingernails and no plaster against a black background gives somebody else a tape. Dan then has to go to the trouble of threading this tape onto the machine. This whole sequence takes way too long. I've shorted it down considerably. We then, though, get a close-up of a different tape player spinning the reel. Notice the length of that centre spindle. He then goes to stop the playback, accidentally moves the switch too far into reverse and quickly corrects with a rather panicky thumb movement. And rather than self-destructing, the tape this time is thrown into a fire by some other bloke who's wearing a grey shirt. And finally, while we're still in Pedantville, here's Jim taking a Concord F20 out of a cardboard box, but then listening to the tape on a Craig 408. Stellman is the only man alive who knows the whereabouts of the fun. Getting back to reality, the Concord F20 box details a number of real-world uses that you could put your sound camera to. Now, notice that none of these are for recording music, as the mechanism is just unsuitable for that. But skipping past the business and industry uses, I'll single out the sound snapshots section here. How many of these recordings do you now make with the voice memo of your phone? You've got a choice of children's first words, highlights of vacations, foreign trips, parties, weddings, anniversaries 
and holidays. That was all a bit holiday-centric. If it wasn't repetitious enough for you, though, it's all repeated on the other side of the box, along with talking letters and school use. But, yeah, it's perhaps more handy nowadays recording these things on video. But at least if you got the next model up, the F85, that one then would have been good enough for music reproduction, given that it had a proper pinch roller and capstan mechanism to maintain a constant 1 and 7 eighths inches per second, although it did cost $15 more at $40. I think the people who bought an F20 probably didn't end up using it too much. On one side of my tape was a faint recording of someone practicing to sing a speech about offshore fishing and on the other side there was a kid doing what every kid did when they get hold of a tape recorder mess about now here we are in tv land folks you know, you know. Mm. hello kids i'm snowbird with the red beard and now yeah a conversation there between the famously talkative snoopy and the red baron Right, I'm going to try recording onto this. Now, bear in mind, it is getting on for 60 years old, so I'm sure it's not performing as well as it did when it was new, although that wouldn't have been particularly good then either. So this is acting as a pause button on the microphone, but we've got it in play at the moment. So to get it into record, we just have to hold down the record button and move it into play. And then when we move this, we're going to be recording. So Let's just talk quite loudly into the microphone to see if it's able to pick this up. I'm sure we're dealing with some rather old capacitors in here, and perhaps even the microphone itself might have failed. But let's give it a go. Let's see what this sounds like. Right, so I'm going to leave that in play. We'll rewind that there, and let's have a listen. Pick this up. I'm sure we're dealing with some rather old capacitors in here. Uh, perhaps even the microphone itself might have failed. But let's give it a go. Let's see what this sounds like. No, that seemed to work really rather well. I'm quite surprised. Now, the two previous devices I've shown were manufactured by Sanyo in Japan and rebranded by Craig in the US. Now, given that this Concorde model was also manufactured in Japan, it's going to originate from one of the other manufacturers there. Now, Craig already has Sanyo tied up and Sony, they like to do their own thing. So I suspected that given the wide range of models that Concorde offered... Some of these were going to originate from the same manufacturer, and that was most likely going to be National Panasonic. And while I couldn't find an exact match for the F20 in the national range, given that the F85 was a National RQ202 and the national range all feature this distinctive red recording button, I'm certain the F20 was one of their models too. The family resemblance is undeniable. I was hoping to find out whether or not this had actually been made by National. There's no signs on it anywhere with regard to that. And I thought maybe inside the case we'll be able to find some markings in there. Well, unfortunately that isn't the case, but I'll just show you how easy this thing opens up. It's just a single screw and then we've got the battery compartment in the back, so we just need to be careful with the wire between those. But yeah, there's nothing in here and we can even take the speaker out of the holder there and there's nothing on the back of there either they've done a good job here of disguising the fact that this is a rim drive mechanism this is the motor here and notice it pivots slightly and when we move the button between play and rewind you'll see that is moving that against either reel so the left reel's turning there and now it's the right although you can't quite see that through there but just that little movement of that is moving the motor against the edge of either of these reels and just like the Sanyo one that I showed before these are rubber around the outside so that little peg is either pushing against this one or that one and it's a friction drive on the rim of the reel. To maintain a constant speed you need a pinch roller and capstan mechanism and of course that doesn't have it it's just a very simple rim drive with a tape that runs across the head here on the bottom. Now, in the show, they always play the tapes with the lid of the machine removed, for no other reason than it was visually interesting. It gave your eye something to look at while you were listening to the voiceover. It was perfectly normal for the time that the shows were made, but you'll still see something like this being used nowadays. Often in documentaries, when they're playing you some audio, they'll show you tape reels advancing, even though nowadays it's usually an anachronism. Often the audio they're playing you originated from a digital source. It's become a bit of a trope. Just one more thing to mention about this. Notice how play is to the right, right? Bear that in mind. Play right in the show. 
it's not always that way. I think they were using some kind of modified props here because sometimes play is stop and rewind is play. And it's just all over the show for the first few seasons. It seems, though, like we get towards the latter episodes that things return to normal. They've just used a normal off-the-shelf device. They must have got through quite a few of these machines over the years. But one other thing I wanted to mention, did you ever wonder what happened to that incriminating folder of photos? It's all right burning the tape, but you've also got to get rid of the folder of pictures that indicate who you're going to be targeting on your next mission. But then again, perhaps it's just a TV series and it's not real life. Anyway, no need to set fire to this video. It self-destructed long ago. That's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.